Hey guys, welcome to my channel, welcome to my Human of Eurovision show and welcome to my Hungarian show. You know, I'm partly Hungarian and I exactly know how pepper and paprika are important things as well as I know how important it is to be head of delegation. So please welcome former head of delegation of Hungary, Lawrence Bubno. <laughs> How are you doing? How are you, man? Good, thanks. Thanks for calling. And well, it's troubling times, but still, I'm good. So it's uh, it's good to be here with you. Uh, how much troubling is it in Hungary right now? Ah, uh, well, it's not too bad actually. So uh, people were a bit more afraid in the springtime. Uh, nowadays, uh, you know, the the overall mood is a bit better, but um, still, we have loads of cases. So we'll see how it turns out. But so far, so good. How how does the situation affect actually the cultural cultural life and the music industry in Hungary? How how is it? Well, I would say there are two different um, sectors because I'm both um, involved in classical music and in the pop music scene. In terms of classical, things are not too bad because we can still do concerts and people are actually going to concerts because you know everybody is so hungry for some new <laughs> experience and, and for something to happen so that actually people still go to concerts. There are loads of live streams as well, but live concerts are still appreciated. On the other hand, the uh, the pop music scene is really much in, in, in rooms, uh, to be honest, because, you know, uh, the whole festival season was cancelled. Um, people are not really getting... Uh, the people who were earning um, all their salary from, from the music industry, they're having a very, very hard time. So um, they are being helped by the government, but, you know, that's, that's only something that probably makes you survive or probably not. So it's not very happy. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's a big, big fluctuation, you know, where people, some of my friends who are working in the industry, they are leaving the industry and doing some very regular day job, like, you know, delivering um, food and things like that. So it's a big, big turnover. Uh, how do you see, how do you see any kind of like changes or like, like, uh, less creativity or has, as you said, some of your friends are leaving the industry. Do you see it as a trend or dangerous trend or is this something which which you believe it's just a part time this COVID situation or this is something we we must be prepped for and and get used to it or just find a way how to how to make the people create in different way. Well, I think uh, I do think it's a challenge that you have to you have to tackle in a way. So you know it's it's pretty much the same for everybody. So if we manage to to keep our jobs in whichever sector we're working in we have to be happy and and you know um i think it's also something that it's it's a good thing to have a challenge i don't want to say that covid is a good thing but i think it's always good to 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 be challenged in life and it's always good to be questioned about the things that you normally do in in your everyday life so uh, i do see the positive side of this whole thing on the other hand, um, I think that there's going to be a big change in the music industry and in the music market in, in the long run as well. Uh, and uh, I also see, so the positive thing is that, for example, in, in our um, way of life and, and in the TV sector, I think now the, the things that we know, the know-how and the experience that we have is also a bit much higher appreciated because now everybody wants wants to do a live stream on, of the concerts of the events and you know uh, suddenly everybody turns to the guys who who have some experience in 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 this industry so i there's also an upside but um, i think that for example as i said many people will uh, have to look for another job and might not return anytime to the creative sector, which is not a good thing, or I don't know if it's a good thing or not, because you know, you never know also when you're working in it, if this is, this has been carved out to you, or this is something that you just started doing and you could do something else uh, and you could enjoy it a bit better. So, you know, these are big, big questions and I don't have the answers because I'm not, you know, a mage or a sage or anything like that. None of us is, but, uh... I believe, you know, the thing is that you said that the people are leaving and, 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 and probably it, it can be better for... 
I my experience is that not the best ones the the best ones or the better ones leaving because they're just have this energy to to do things and they're just not they're just not satisfied with just anything everything stopped or uh they see it as an opportunity to do something else as well as those like lots of people especially in in TV industry who are not that good I would say or or I wouldn't I wouldn't mind to not to work with them if I can choose it uh they're still there so uh I'm not sure if it if it, if it's gonna work the the great way, but we'll see. We'll see. It's an opportunity that that we, that we both agree probably. Uh, but what's the what is this the opportunity for you? What 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 are you taking from it? What what are you doing now? Well, um, I'm I I haven't been working for the TV for for over a year now. So after the the previous Eurovision that actually took place, I I left the TV company uh, because uh, also when I was head of delegation for Hungary, I was already um, a musician, uh, and I I have two projects. One is the main one, which is which is classical music, which is which is a choir. It's called Saint Ephraim Male Choir, and it's it's well. You can find loads of information about it on the internet. I don't want to bore anybody, but it's it's an eight-piece uh, vocal ensemble actually, and we do we don't just do sacred music. We we do all types of music and all types of uh, we also write pieces for ourselves. So it's a very varied repertoire and and a very um, I hope colorful um, um, ensemble or group. And and I'm also I'm I'm not just singing in the group, but um. Uh, together with my father, we're doing the the artistic direction for the, for the for the choir, and I'm also doing every everything that's connected to to management. So I have a, a small team, uh, and we handle everything from marketing, PR, um, concert organization, you know, legal stuff, everything else. So you know, the way how you operate a co- company basically, and uh, so that's that's the main. Uh, that's the main job, uh, and of course, that's why I said that I'm involved in in the classical segment a bit more. Uh, on the other hand, I have uh, a solo project, so to say. It's a very fancy word, but it's pretty much just me doing some music on my own. Uh, it's a live looping project called Nomic, and uh, this is about. Right now, it's just me about having fun, and we'll see where where this thing goes because I just started it out when I left the TV actually, and I wanted to to use some of my remaining creative energies to do something that's that's completely me. Yeah, I absolutely must say that I I heard some of your songs because that, like you're posting them on Instagram and and YouTube and and Facebook. I uh, saw so a few sessions you have. Uh, I must say this is the one of the best views I ever 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 seen because like uh, because we you must I, I'll put some links below and 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 into the video because I think people deserve to see it, uh, especially how how a good combination of music which somebody will like, somebody will not, of course, but the whole experience watching it for me it's it, it's like. It's vibrating. It really works, and and I appreciate how how you care about how you're doing stuff, and that really, really means that you're you're becoming from from a creative creative environment, and I can see I can see it even now. Like you take care how 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 does this video look as well? So I I really appreciate that. Back to your head of delegation times. Uh, you were you were starting being head of delegation in 2017, probably 2016 for the for the selection process already. How was this uh, experience was, for well, you when you? How was this experience for you when you were just starting to do it before the previous experience? Um, it was a big change, actually. I must confess. Well, I told this everybody in the in the Eurovision uh, team that I I didn't really follow Eurovision, so I wasn't a fan or anything before. Um, I was um, I came funnily enough. I don't come from TV background. I have radio background, and I was uh, producing radio shows for for years before I was. Um, transferred to the international relations department of the tv company so uh of the because you know it's the same company radio and tv in hungary 
uh, the public broadcaster and um, it funnily enough it wasn't like that that the producer of the Hungarian selection show is head of delegation which I think it's it should be that way but that was not the case uh, with us so I was not supposed to be involved in the creative process but of course I couldn't help myself uh, from the beginning uh, because I was, you know, it was like just a manager role to be head of delegation or oh, that's what they thought that it should be. And um, But when I was um, assigned to this task, I was already in a way involved in the selection. Uh, I didn't take any part in the 2016, so in the, in the Swedish uh, Eurovision outing, but I was already involved in Odal. I, I didn't make any decisions, uh, but I was following um, the show that year I was only following the show because I didn't really know anybody. So it was also a learning process, you know, because it's always teamwork, as all of us know. So And it's really, really teamwork. So it's never one person. It's never just the guy or the guys on the stage or the girls. It's never just, of course, not the head of delegation or the assistant head of delegation or, or anybody or the director. It's, it's a big bunch of people working towards the same goal. So I think the biggest thing was getting to know the people who actually make things happen and who actually uh, you know design the production that's put on stage on Eurovision and also uh, I had to get to know the people who work on the other side I mean at the Eurovision side because uh, of course there are some changes but the main characters are the same and um, it's much much easier to you know to harmonize the things that you have in mind with your team with with them if you have a good good connection and if you can talk to each other and and you know have ideas and you can see already uh in their eyes when you're when you're presenting your ideas if it, this is going to work or not and if not you have to let it go so yeah i think it was a big 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 learning process for me as well and uh, i was really um you know it was a i i never worked on such a, a huge production so it that was the the size was immense and that was the biggest you know surprise for me that something this big is actually happening every year that I didn't know about or I didn't follow and it's so bloody professional and uh, it was a big so I was really surprised because you know I also had my own prejudices and my own biases about Eurovision and then I was put into the middle of the whole thing and I said oh my goodness you can you can say anything but um, this is television at its best yeah I, I absolutely agree I'm just I'm just you know nodding here it's like I, I got the very similar process the year before, in 2016, 2015, 16, and couldn't imagine the scale of the show. That was the probably the like the biggest shock at the beginning. But I, but, but there's something interesting. You said that you have your own bias, prejudices to Eurovision before. What, what was those, and and how did they change? If they changed. They absolutely change because, you know, the basic thing was, but that's also comes from my background as a trained classical musician that, you know, the uh, I'm not saying a new thing here and I'm not I don't want to offend every offend anybody because that's not what I think now. But people say that Eurovision songs mostly suck. Uh, and so this is the overall opinion uh, also um, with musicians and, you know, not um, it's not a surprise uh, that not too many good bands actually entered the Eurovision uh, Song Contest, for example, in Hungary. Um, I mean, the selection show, because they don't think that this is something that would change their career. Uh, and actually, uh, I don't agree with this anymore. And I don't think that Eurovision songs suck because there's a very, you know, there are 40 something songs every year and it's impossible not to have a few good ones. And actually, it's not just a few. So. Um, when, when I listen to all the songs um, every year, there are some that I don't like personally or that I could criticize uh, from a mu musical point of view, but um, or also from a production pro point of view, to be honest. But, but I don't care because there are some very, very good ones and, and every year. And um, 
well, I don't want to be, you know, very upfront, but for example, what you did in the Czech Republic and especially Lake Malawi, the last time that was, for me, it was mind blowing. And that's something that you, you can put in the window because uh, I mean, to everybody to watch that, come on, this is, this is a pop band. They are alternative. So they, they come from what we call in Hungarian alternative music. And uh, still, uh, still they, they managed to get to the Euro Eurovision, Eurovision stage without losing their integrity. Uh, so that's something great. And I think that's also something that we try to do with, with AWS, the metal band, that uh, we try to, to let them do whatever they want. We didn't want to, you know, alter uh, the way how they operate and they, we didn't want to make a Eurovision act from them. They just had to do their own thing and, and it worked actually because, uh, for example, they went into the finals with a song that was absolutely underground. Yeah. Uh... For me, that was a great surprise that you have this this band. I was I was about to talk about it later, but let let's do it now. Because like I always use it as an example, one of those examples what what Eurovision can be. Like there is no limit of what kind of song it can be. It can be a great metal band there, and you know the staging with all those fires. It was like, yeah, it deserves to be there. Uh, it's a contrapunct to to what happened the year before with Salvador Sobral, which was absolutely like without any effect, but that was super effective. And that was the opposite. And super effective as well, in my opinion, like to, to not extremes, just two things that deserves to be there and great examples of not, there's no need for following what the Eurovision should be, like this classical cliche, as well as the like Eurovision music sucks in general. I don't believe it's true, but it can be of course true. It depends on how you how you approach this project, how each country approach this project and what each year changed. And as I talk to like, you know, other head of delegations or ex head of delegations and other producers, I'm just finding out that it's very different country to country, but the goal is mostly the same, get to the final, you know. So how was it? for you and Odal national selection for you because like if I just say your three years as a head of delegation you got Yossi Papai, AWS and Yossi Papai again and Yossi Papai for me was a uh, something which is very like nationalistic thing not in a wrong way but it was you know in Hungarian uh, language it, 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 it was really different once it works once it, it doesn't it didn't work uh was it something you you wanted from Odal or if if it's just on you how would you change the selection process or was this right how do you feel about it i because i'm no longer working with them i can tell you i would definitely change the selection process uh in a way that it has uh more to say uh, with the audience votes because uh the way how it works is that the jury decides about the final five and then uh, the audience votes select the, the one that wins from that five. But um, sometimes uh, the jury, uh, they ex exclude some of the, of the audience favorites uh, who would otherwise win the selection uh, if they would be in the final five. So that I, I wouldn't say that this is... Uh, um, so, yeah, you know, it's, it's a decision from the side of the broadcaster. And if they decided to do so, I'd... I can't do anything about it, but I think it would be more fair. On the other hand, uh, if this wouldn't be the case, um, Yotzi uh, wouldn't have won Adal in 2017 because uh, there was another girl who was who had a very good song, actually very very similar to to the song by uh, Jamala, Ukraine. Uh, so I I thought that yeah I think she will she would win. But if she wins, uh, she will. Uh, she wouldn't qualify for the finals because her song is pretty much the same as as Jamala's song, and you know the Eurovision community knows it. Uh, yeah, I know you you can never predict anything, so that's also true. But I thought that uh, in that case, it was it was a lucky break that that Yotzi came out first because he 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 then did a great job um, in in Eurovision for the first time. Uh, also in in the second my second year. Um, I think AWS would have won anyway because it was a surprise that there were two metal bands actually uh, in the in the selection show. There are 30, 30 entries every year 
uh, in Adal, and uh, there were two metal bands. So that means, oh, no, three, sorry. That means that so some of the audience was already, you know, pretty much in from this community, from the metal community. So, and they are very loyal to, to their favorites. So they were actually watching the show and they were actually voting. So you could tell from the beginning that they might, that there might be a surprise. And for the third time, uh, you know, there was a huge, huge change, for example, in, in Yoti's life because um, from from being a nobody, because he, he was pretty much unknown. In OK, Hungary I didn't know that he, he won. Adult. Yeah, uh, but but since then, he's one of the biggest, uh, biggest names. So for him, it was a big, big win, uh, the whole Eurovision thing. Uh, and for the second time when he won it, uh, I think there was I was there was one other uh, entry which was pretty similar to, to his that could have won but but when when we came to the final it was pretty much clear that he's going to win because he has the huge a very very huge fan base and uh, i don't want to skip any topics so i will say this as well that uh, you you know in hungary we have um, some ethnic minorities and the biggest is the gypsy minorities the roma minority and and the is, is is a gypsy guy as we all and he's very proud of his uh, of his ancestry and uh, that community is also very strong so so i think it was also a community thing that uh, the the gypsy community are very together and they wanted yotzi to win both years and they they helped him with votes so that's i don't think it's a bad thing but but that's also it's a very good thing actually that they come together on their under such a great uh, achievement like a song uh, but that was one of the reasons why he won both times. Um, so, but back to your question, I would definitely change the process. Uh, if, well, it depends on what they want to do. If we want to have a good, um, you know, a good result in, in Eurovision, then I would absolutely involve the international audience for the voting. If they don't care about it, as they say they don't, uh, well, now, be because we're not going to Eurovision, then it's, it's pretty cl clear that they don't. Uh, then, then it's okay like this. But uh, but I think if uh, if the goal was to have a good result at Eurovision, we should involve international audience absolutely. Okay, so I'll I'll just put this question back. I just change it a bit. That's a, that's a really interesting topic. Uh, what if you if you are in charge? If you if you would be the one who has this real like major major say in what's going to happen in national selection for Hungary. Uh, is, the, is, the, is, is, is implementing the international audience the only thing? Or what would be your approach? What would you like to, to show? What, 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 what would be your way, way of selecting? What, what would you like to show in Eurovision if it's just up to you? Actually, I think there is one good thing that I, I would take away from, from from the current format is uh, I think that many other people do as well is that we, we don't uh, want uh, performance to c come in and bring them together with writers. I want to have singer song writers. I think that's the best thing that can happen at Eurovision as well. Um, and uh, the only thing, so what I would do is pretty much um, um, a PR or marketing campaign in Hungary for uh, for making musicians believe that Eurovision is not just a, an opportunity, uh, well, which which is not good for your career. It's something where you can show your songs, your own songs, for 200 million viewers across the globe, and um, you shouldn't care about uh, you know the outcome. Is just uh, the so, and you know if. You have some bias or prejudice about the setting and about the whole Eurovision. You should bloody forget that and just come and play. So that would that would be the first thing that I would do to to you know try to break down this barrier that Hungarian musicians and probably musicians some in other countries as well have towards Eurovision and and tell them that this is this is actually a good thing and and you should you should seize every opportunity. So that's one thing. The other thing is uh, if. If, if, if it would be me, I would involve, um, you know, so uh, very, so the songwriting thing is very important. So it's good if, if to have songwriters, singer songwriters to come in, but I would, I would give them help because some of them are actually not ready, not TV ready in a way, uh, but, and also the songs, they are not ready to be performed. So I would somehow involve 
a camp or something else to, to prepare them for the live show setting because they are not very, um, you know, used to that. And the third thing, but that has nothing to do with Eurovision actually, but uh, mm -hmm. I would really um, do a live, live show where, where instruments are also live or at least partly live because uh, I know that, of course, I know very well that from a TV point of view, it's much, much easier and the sound is, can be much better with, uh, with you know, pre-recorded backing tracks and just like... And like fair kind of like... No one, no one will do mistake. No one will mistake you. That's the thing as well. Yeah, but on the other hand, I think uh, so. For example, the the format in Hungary, the the thing that I don't like about it is that you know there are uh, separate. So we have the um, semi final, then the then another round, and then we have a final, and they play it. Now they change it, and they now have an acoustic version in in the second round, and then they play it once more in the original way. But I would we would have to figure something out. I, I don't think it's a good thing to play this, the same th same song three times the same way. So that's why it would be good to to involve um, or, or or at least to give a chance for the for the musicians and the acts to 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 alter the backing track and still you know and have a final version after the show before Eurovision. So I don't think it would be. Oh, I would also make this a rule because it's much more interesting for them and for the audience as well to to have uh, a different sounding track uh so the odal odal is still continues even eurovision doesn't so that that's of course something which i'm super interested in uh there are two things i'm super interested in why have you left why have you left and the second one is why the Eurovision is cancelled. What's the PR of Eurovision in Hungary in general? Is you know there were so many rumors about LGBTQ plus community and politicians involved. And I'm super curious of both of those things and if they're if they're in connection with you as well. Um, well, first of all, and I told this everybody who asked. So my the the thing that i was going to leave was already decided before uh before i went to tel aviv so and i decided it because uh, my my son was born the previous year and uh, i was um you know i was already doing the same amount of work in saint ephraim choir so i was we, we were having actually 120 concerts every year with the choir which is a lot then i'm also doing all the organization behind these concerts and you know when i was leaving for two weeks for Eurovision every year. And I was also leaving for 10 days for young uh, Eurovision, young musicians. And, you know, it was nothing. So I had to save my family life and I wanted to, to, to see my son growing up. So my decision to leave was absolutely up to this factor. So I wanted to do music. And uh, although I loved being head of delegation, um, I, I had to choose. Uh, I didn't know actually before I left that um, because I didn't talk to anybody from management. I didn't know that we're not going to continue uh, being a part of Eurovision. Actually, honestly, uh, because you know, you could read everything in the media. And of course, I didn't talk to anybody since then from the management side because I didn't have any friends in, in company management at, at MTVA. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure about uh, the, the reasons behind uh, Hungary leaving, but I think it's twofold. One is money. I think it's uh, because, you know, uh, participating in Eurovision costs a lot of money. And um, and of course, we are not a very, very rich country. So we uh, if we have to cut something and if they don't think that this is, this is good for the country image, then it was pretty sure that they're going to cut this. On the other hand, uh, and this is true, so this is not just uh, the broadcaster, but Hungarians are... Uh, still need some time i think to be be prepared like western europe for the lgbtq plus community and and how to accept uh you know people and um it's actually the i think but that's a personal opinion uh nowadays it's a big deal so people do give a shit about your sex, sexual orientation and i i don't agree with this so this is this is not a big deal i mean uh this is not something that we should 
we should talk about so much so this is yeah or care about or uh, care about yeah so we can talk about it sorry i didn't want to say that because you know of course injustice is something that we should talk against but uh, i mean the the fact that somebody's gay or lesbian or i don't know or anything else or queer so what okay so this is this has nothing to do with how they think what kind of people they are they can be so of course there uh, there are people who are not your friends and still gay there are people who are friend your friends and gay so it's the same it's it doesn't change anything but that's not the overall view of hungarians well not probably not my age and not my generation but the older generation but you know this has been pretty much a stigma in the whole post socialist countries i think and and i think that's something that we all struggle with and we still need a few generations for this to to you know to tilt back in place and uh, and i'm not very optimistic so it will take some time for people to be more um, you know open and be more uh, relaxed about this whole topic because now when when anybody starts to talk about this either politicians or in the media then everybody goes <laughs> and every day they want to they're at each other's throats and um, you know what i say most of the time to people to to go travel meet people and you know it's it's much harder to say anything bad about the lgbtq community if they if you actually know people from that community yeah i like, absolutely agree i think that this post community post communistic syndrome is everywhere i'm a bit lucky that we're living in Czech republic and it's always been like fuck off everything you know i don't think it's a really good thing to doesn't care about anything but that's how how the mentality here is kind of but this is of course a, a theme in here still especially like generational change and of course the big cities against like the small uh, outskirts or countryside but uh, you you mentioned that it could be the eurovision cancellation could have something to do with the budget and I, I of course know how, how much does it cost S many countries I think the countries big like like others have probably similar wealth countries uh, struggle the same problem I wouldn't say it's too expensive but I definitely would say it definitely definitely worth it it, it it worth the money because of the advertisement it do how it can help the whole industry the music industry in, in in a long term and i think that's something what public broadcaster actually should should do what's what's your opinion about that i i, I absolutely agree so i um i don't think that it's too expensive because yeah uh, of course we can't talk about it but we all know that all the, all the numbers how uh, how much it costs for a, a broadcaster to to take part in it and you know compared to to a yearly budget it's nothing and compared to the production of a of for example a selection show it's not too much so so it's it's still i think reasonable and of course you're also from from a budgeting side so it's not just three programs that you buy for this uh, for this amount of money so it's not just the two semifinals in, and the final but you're producing loads of programs before that so for this money you're you're buying good quality content and really high standard television uh so i think it's in my opinion it's a bargain price but but it's not me who decides uh and also if um for example but uh so i just want to to understand both sides so i would say that if uh, the broadcaster put some more money behind it and some more pr some more marketing and and you know try to use it as a platform to to draw in um talented people and talented musicians and well not just musicians because you know with the bands you're meeting loads of managers you're meeting loads of creative people who who think about design and how things should look like in the program and things like that so it's uh, it's also a very very good networking uh, type of event the whole selection process um so it could be used uh, in a more wisely and in a more effective way i think but um if the broadcaster is afraid of the public opinion about the lgbtq community which i think they are uh then they they have that's i think that's why they decided that you know on on the one hand it costs money 
uh, well, if it's too much or not too much, that's up to one's opinion, but it does cost money. And if people don't watch it and if people are, uh, you know, biased towards uh, towards the LGBTQ element, which I don't think is very important with Eurovision, but everybody says that it's important. So, you know, you can't really change public thinking. Uh, then it's something, you know, so that's, uh, I, I can understand without any, you know, uh, any negative thoughts. I, I can understand the management point of view, why, why they decided that, okay, that's not a game for us. Uh, I don't, I wouldn't do that, but I can understand why they did it. Would you say, that probably the management of the of, of, of like in general those posts communistic TVs are like very similar generation, which probably that's even my 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 uh, own experience that they're just take the theme as something which is huge and what I w that, that what I was missing is that 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 they don't see the Eurovision as a platform they can they could use much wider for the generation who doesn't care about this and they just care about the music and what what I what I just had the problem is that we always at the TV because I was doing entertainment for like almost 10 years we always giving chance mostly to the like most famous people who were lucky in 90s and they was given a like a wide wide uh, time in TV in general, it was commercial, even the public broadcaster, all of it. And nowadays I, I see that the young musicians aren't allowed to, there are not so many programs for them uh, in, the, in, in the biggest TVs. And uh, no one wants to risk anything. And I think that our block kind of, if I can say, stagnates a lot. And the Eurovision for me, what is like a bright star on the, on the sky, which can change it as not just the whole three, as you said, three uh, TV programs, TV shows that you have, but the whole process, the whole platform, the whole networking, because like, I don't know how, how was it for you, but for me, the, the, the Eurovision was a game changer, not, not even just how the scale of the Eurovision, but the people I met as well, how they inspired me, how the TV can be done as well. Uh, the ideas I had then for like, like Malawi staging and whatever, they did just come from those people, the inspiration you have, and then they would want to compete them, and they 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 teach you a lot. So did they teach you a lot? Did 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 your TV experience from the beginning to two thousand nineteen when you when you just cancelled it kind of changed you in this way? Well, absolutely. Um, I also think that, for example, my colleagues who who I work with on the stagings um, after after the selections, I think they also. Um, you know, um, they are much, much more experienced than I am. Most of them, I mean, the director and things like that, who, who, who worked at the actual staging. And I could see how much liberated they were uh, by the by the opportunities that they have had, because uh, they, they knew that now we can do something actually good. We, we don't have any, you know, because actually we didn't have any, you know, uh, plans. I mean, coming from, from above and from management, we, we could do whatever we wanted actually uh, and uh, that was you know the creative uh, the creative freedom that we gained w was huge and if if you are allowed to do things then I think you do learn new things so you it's unavoidable uh, to, to you know to to bump into new ideas and to talk what you said to talk to the others I mean and, and to see the other stagings and you know for example I remember in in uh, yeah, in Tel Aviv, when, when I was watching the the Australians rehearse, you know, with with the huge poles oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> fly, flying outside of the arena, and I was saying, "Oh my goodness, this this is this is huge!" And then then how it looked on in in the stadium, it was it was awesome. And you know, you, you just go and talk to people and and ask about how things are getting done and how okay, how did you do? Oh my god, yeah, it it looks good and. Or even just by watching the rehearsals um, and and you know seeing the camera angles and sometimes noticing the step changes how they do it it's it's a huge huge learning curve and uh, well for me at least it was it was huge and and it really changed the way how I um, I think about TV but to 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 answer the first part of your question I think uh, the that's the big problem that it 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 doesn't change. It, 
everybody and it doesn't change for example the the people who are uh, who are running the big tv companies because they are you know they are playing safe and i don't think that eurovision is about playing safe it's about trying out new ideas and still there's a safety net because you have the huge audience you have uh, very loyal fans who will who will watch the Eurovision, which whatever happens on stage, actually. But uh, but then actually there are some very creative and bold uh, new things that are being tried out. And there are, of course, some conservative stagings, but that's all right. So you you can't go always nuts 100 percent. So you have some some it depends on many factors. But yeah, I think it's a big problem that Eurovision is something that we could all I, actually learn from because uh, because it's such uh, a free creative community and uh, you are not uh, so there are some very very few limitations that you have to consider uh, and it mostly down to physics for example <laughs> what, I, what i mean is uh, we we wanted to, to have this, a huge even this sometimes is a, it's not a problem so that's also true but for example the last year with with, with yoti's uh, second uh, so the tel aviv show we wanted to have a big veil hanging down from from back uh, from the back of the stage and we wanted to have a uh, projection on the veil uh, but then it turned out that we it's impossible to do it because there are no the, from the trusses you can't hang something that heavy next to the next to the lamps so then it was cancelled and we had to rethink the staging but uh, but pr that was the only thing that I that I ha that I heard a no from the Eurovision production team well that's awesome uh, just I, I will be just about looping this question again uh, because this is a like great theme because I've, uh, this, you're the first person I'm, I'm talking to who has the similar experience from a similar mentality or region country uh, than, the, than, than the others. And uh, don't you see that cancelling Eurovision is a mistake in the way, as we just talking, how much experience, how much uh, inspiration, not just you get, but the whole industry or the whole like like a lot of people are involved in the process and say they see the scale is the same as you and they are even they don't want to they're involved in the process they they are there and see other countries how they're doing it and in my opinion this is something which which can really inspire everyone and that can after you know rise up or better the whole industry in the in in, in the countries which are not that used to do such a shows in, in in their in their in their countries and they're more like conservative in the approach and there's in my opinion stagnating a bit how they're doing things and when you just go to Eurovision and you see it's not that hard to to go around those things and do it better it's just the mindset kind of thing so absolutely uh, that's the other thing I think the country is just just canceling Eurovision losing because that they're putting money into in, investing into the people who are who can rise the industry and take it further. So what do you think about it? Absolutely. Well, I, I think um, so. I, I have two, two, two things that I want to say in relation to this. Absolutely. Absolutely. For example, I was also attending loads of uh, conferences, loads of international events um, uh, organized by the EBU before Eurovision. For example, my favorite and probably still my favorite uh, EBU event is Eurosonic Festival in, in, in the Netherlands where we were also sending a band every year and I was managing that uh, that project as well from 2015 and um, when you when you go to such an event and you see how it works and, and I, I can also tell that for example some of the Hungarian well talking about Eurosonic now some of the Hungarian concert promoters and festival directors I, I could say for example see that for example the the organizers of Siget Festival who went for the Eurosonic conference and the concerts I could see the same names coming back and play at Siget the next year and they are they were absolutely you know unknown uh, performance a year before and then the year they came they were huge names so um, and, and it you know it justifies the whole thing how it works and and when when I was going for a conference or for for an international event I was always um, you know really um, I had, you know, this drive, okay, yeah, we should do this and, and this is a good idea and I should talk to this person and that person and tell them that they had this project and it's great. And yeah, you know, but then 
unfortunately reality always kicks in for example in Hungary and then then you come home with full of full of ideas and and slowly and gradually you 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 slump back into the same swamp actually so that's my experience so it's very hard to to stay motivated but every year when you when you go back again it's is the same spirit or, or probably even more because the more experience you get uh, the more uh, you know the more um, you can take away from the certain certain Eurovisions, for example, and more ideas. So that's one thing. The other thing is I, I would really uh, make most of the Hungarian cultural and creative sector at least go out for a few rehearsal days for Eurovision because I also heard some opinions and I, I'm really I was really, you know, upset about this when I heard it that I ah, yeah, we could we could do that. Um, I'm sorry, but no. So without experience, <laughs> you, you you wouldn't be able to any, do anything similar to that. Uh, and and I really hate when when people think that um, that it's very easy. How easy it is? But but it's not. I mean, come on. I, I mean, talking to to anybody. I mean, I was talking to one of the the Norwegian guys uh, off off stage who was doing the the steady cam, and and he was doing it for I think 15 years, and he is doing also the uh, melody festival, and 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 uh, I mean he was great, and uh, and and it, I was you know checking how how it works because for example I never had a steady in my hand before, but I I was watching how it works with Q pilot. Uh, for the viewers, I'm saying that's the that's the uh, very sophisticated system that Eurovision is using for changing the scenes. So you're not changing it by hand. The uh, director is not changing, but it's pre-programmed, and it's it's very interesting yeah, to it's see. It's kind of like a long, like a live live program script, yeah. which helps everybody on, like live doing changes and see what's what's gonna happen in a real time and even edit things. So that that's great thing to, to have. And it's also very good for 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 uh, re so, I mean rethinking because you have when we as heads of delegations get the rehearsal footage we also get the footage with the queue pilot cues so we can very easily give feedback to to the to the directors and the stage director and everybody else. Uh, so for example, I was talking to the steady guy and I saw how, how it worked and and how complicated the whole thing is and I remember that at, it was also in Tel Aviv. And uh, in, during one of the one of the I think it was rehearsal three, so in front of an audience, but it was not recorded. And I uh, and the two studies were, were both on stage and uh, and I and they they messed it up. And, and the guy that I was talking to, he, he moved to the wrong direction and he was, you know, standing right in front of the other steady cam. And I could so see on his face that fuck. <laughs> 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 but they these mistakes don't really happen so so and you, there are so many factors where you could make a mistake and of course we all do but uh, you know seeing a 3 hour live program uh, going down with unnoticeable mistakes or with no mistakes at all i mean come on uh, when people say in hungary that we could do this i'm sorry but no so you you should be in the same experience and in the same boat to be able to do this a few years after yeah, that, I, I think that's the, that's the common thing in here. I remember, I remember that this is gonna be my intermezzo a bit, but th th this is very interesting what you say. Uh, I remember when we were planning the national national finals, which which didn't happen, but that doesn't matter. And there was a guy who was about to to build the stage for us, and he was involved in two thousand seven, the first Czech performance at Eurovision at all, and. I was shocked because we I was talking like we wanted to really uh, carefully talk and prepare each act we have in this national selection like it is in Eurovision and how much time it, it, it takes because like we, we wanted we, we wanted to involve you know artists their management like everybody else to believe in the idea and really have the staging going from them so it, it's a complex thing and this guy Told me I was there in 2007. We went there. They told us they they can do this and this and that for us, and that was it. And that's how we gonna do. It. I was like, no, no, it's not like how it works right now. It's a like three months process when you ask, you do, you you, you prep, you prep, you you rehearse somewhere. Then it's camera angles. Camera angles can do wonders for you, and everything can be like planned for milliseconds. And like, well, no, no of course. I, and there was those cases like we can do it. Like now we've never done it in here before. Never, no, never, ever. So like, how can you, like, I know you're like how you all work 
and how lazy can it sometimes be and say like this is great and I was like well it's great for like this country but I want to go like 10 years further you know like like we're, we're losing like decades in in elements that can be used and how it can be used and how perfectly it can be organized and and that was something that is something why why I always say like the Eurovision is really necessary and maybe it's great that, that we are not involved anymore somehow and maybe but it's gonna be good that, that other people will just run in, and, and learn as, as well like more people are involved learn this process this this kind of thing is better for for the whole industry I think it's good for Eurovision as well because a bigger competition those big countries or not just big in, the, in how big they are in the scale but the good the, the countries are just doing the best professional like Swedes, Norwegians, um, Italy, like so many others and Australians and and we want to get to the phase that we can compete them not randomly but really like be a serious competition so that's that's that, that's that, that's the common thing I think for 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 our region man you you told me that you, you that that's a great thing to inspire others I think that this this podcast kind of interview should should do to others to inspire them as well and you were saying a lot about traveling and how that inspired you as well not just Eurovision but the other other traveling and events which which were which were great and as well your English always were perfect when I saw you first time and you talked to me I was like is he English how this happened is that your like school experience or, 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 or how how is it how is it possible that you have such a great accent and such a great such a great English. Uh, well, actually, it's funny because thank you very much for the compliment. I'm, well, I'm, I'm always struggling, and I'm, I'm not always, uh, you know, um, satisfied with how the way I talk. Because, for example, you should, you should listen to my brother. We, we never lived abroad or anything like that. We, I, I actually, my first degree is is English, so I studied English at university. But um, that's not a must to to have a good uh, pronunciation because you know it's more about literature than than actually talking but um you the way the reason why i'm saying that my brother is is very funny because he he learned the cockney accent and absolutely uh, you know flawless british accent when he was like 20 i don't know how he did it he has a good year for that and then uh, his wife is australian well half hungarian half, half australian and now he talks the the absolute Un understandable Australian accent and without without a flaw so somehow I just wanted to say this bit because somehow it's it runs in the family that we we have an ear for for language I wouldn't say that all languages but for for English um, for English it's it's good and I'm I don't do anything special I'm just watching loads of TV and and series and films in English and I always did that I remember I was watching Cartoon Network, which I don't recommend to do for with, with anybody's kids, but but I watched it all the time when I was a kid and when my par parents weren't home, and it was still in English. So that was the only only channel that was running in English. So I was watching the tales in English. So probably that has something to do with it. But well, actually, thank you very much for the compliment. And I, um, it's always easier. The, the good thing is, and I and I tell this to everybody because I don't know how it's in the Czech Republic but in the Hungarian broadcaster that was a big big plus that I could actually talk English so that was something that and and I was sent to to very unlikely occasions and meetings because I they knew that I was going to understand <laughs> what they were about to stay there and I can I can tell them about things and that's why everybody who's working in the TV industry or anybody who's uh, who's still young and still wants to work at the TV industry, learn English. It's it's a must. And if you if you learned it then you can you can go anywhere because still it's it's a struggle for some of the people, unfortunately. Yeah, it's the same in Czech Republic. I think the the one one like one point me being head of delegation was that I was probably the only one who could who could speak English as well. So uh, <laughs> Same here. My English and my English really sucked back then. So uh you know that's that's crazy and and I share this recommendation with you I think it's I wouldn't say it's a must but I think if you want to if you want to experience something we both experienced yeah that's a must that's something which can especially in our countries it can like 
rocket jump you into the world, which is very different from what we what we have in our countries, and it's kind of a hidden, even it's so close. Yeah, absolutely agree. So, Laurent, I think that's everything. Is there something you would like to share with me? I didn't ask, and uh, maybe maybe you can you, we can we can finish it with something. Uh, something about your project, uh, your Nomic project, which which we were talking a bit in the, in the beginning of this interview, but it was like a brief that you're doing it. But can you just tell the audience what is it? What is really what it really is? How would you name it? Well, it's it's um, well, to to be a bit to show off a bit. I would say that it's it's a one man show, but uh, but I want to make it into into just a simple show. So right now it's it's a live looping project. So it's just me with some MIDI controllers and some instruments and a microphone singing, playing, and you know playing drums and synths and everything else. So it's about you know uh, because I was I was always a team player. And that's why I wanted to try myself out how I work alone when I can decide about everything. Uh, so, you know, because of course compromises are good and we, we live off of compromises, but sometimes it's good not to have a compromise, it's just with myself. Uh, so that's the basic idea behind the Gnomic project. But uh, right now it's really, as I said, just for fun, just for, um, just for making music and for, um, for, um, for seeing how people react to that, uh, hopefully in a in a few, I don't know months, years, I, I want to to release because right now I'm just releasing these as videos, so I'm not making um, songs. Actually, they are songs, but they are not released on any any streaming platforms or things like that. But that's the next step. So I want to turn these into actual uh, recorded songs that, that can be released because now they only work with the video. So if you take the picture away, I wouldn't, uh, post it anywhere. Uh, but I want to make them songs and, and we'll see where it goes. So this is, uh, I, I already had, um, many, many bands that I played in, well, a decade ago and since then as well. But, uh, but then I turned to classical music, which, which became my living, my, my major thing. But, uh, but I never let go of my, my initial dream that I want to do something with pop music as well, because I'm pretty much this guy who's always in between two words and, and I'm both a classical musician and a rock musician, actually, because that's where I come from. Uh, and, uh, I want to, I want to use both words in my in my daily life so that's why i'm doing this live looping project so check it out okay let's check it out <laughs> Let's 
me.